uh, which is getting us to the end here. So uh, that's something we need to discuss, um, uh, both in this class as well as Sunday morning, which is what are we going to study next? Uh, we've talked about, uh, I believe, Roman. I think last time we, we did this together, uh, the options on the table beyond what we're studying now were the Book of Romans, um, which if we were to study the Book of Romans, uh, we could either order books, I believe. If not, we can print them out. Um, I, I have them on PDF somewhere. And uh, we can also study um, the Shovel Breaks, which was Michael Shank. And he did muscle in a shovel, which we studied. The shovel breaks is in regard to uh, his efforts to uh, be restored, is my understanding. So uh, if you have anything uh, in mind that you would prefer over those two, please let me know. Uh, if not, whenever we finish this and whenever we finish roll call, which I believe will probably be both next week, unless we get through chapter 13 tonight, uh, which I don't see that happening, but we might. Um, so we'll pick up on uh, one of them for Wednesday night and one of them for Sunday morning. If you have a preference in that regard as to which one you'd like to study, which, which class, let me know. Uh, and so the opportunity is available until we uh, get there. And if nothing's made known to me, then I'll, I'll, I'll make the call, I guess. Um, let's go to chapter 13, learning from our mistakes, how to handle bad decisions. You might remember the context here of um, uh, Brother Lewis's study He's really trying to emphasize the fact that our decisions have consequences. And if we make a decision and choose whether it be right or wrong, uh, there can be a snowball effect. And we can begin to uh, suffer if we make the wrong choices and long term uh, end up with consequences that maybe we didn't anticipate when we initially made that decision. Uh, but the same is true with good decisions. Um, and here he's really highlighting the fact that uh, we are going to make uh, bad decisions or we, we uh, may make certain bad decisions that are, that are maybe worse if you want to use that terminology, although on the side of God there's no such thing, uh, than others, but maybe worse in the sense of the, their consequences. So what do we do uh, when we make bad decisions? How to handle them the correct way? Why is it that we are unable, and he goes into several things, and we'll look at those, but why is it as faithful children of God, as those who are striving for faithfulness, why do we struggle uh, to even get to the point where we're willing to realize and admit, which is his first two points, that we even made a mistake, that we even made a bad decision, that we've committed sin? Why is it that we are challenged to get to that point as those who are striving for faithfulness. What are some reasons? Yeah. Just don't want to admit it. Why? Yeah. We don't want to admit pride. <laughs> what pride? What else? We don't want to admit we're weak. Weakness? Absolutely. Pride? Embarrassment? Embarrassment. Okay. Uh, anything else? Think about your children for a second. Or think about you as a child. Um, if you were striving to do what mommy and daddy said, if you were striving to obey mom and dad, and there was a moment in time when you didn't obey them, uh, why was it that you were so challenged to just confront it? What are some other, are there some other reasons? <laughs> what is that? Right. I mean, really, that, that's maybe a reason, too, potentially. You don't want to let them down. Of course, you already have. You don't want to tell them. <laughs> right? Uh, a little of defensiveness, which is in the line with pride and, and admitting we're weak. Essentially, it's saying, I, I didn't want to do this, but I did. And, and, and by me admitting that I did this, really, it makes it seem like, or it could be perceived as, I wanted to do it. Uh, and I ultimately chose it, it's true, but uh, I, I'm trying to do what's right. So I, 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 in my efforts to try to do what's right, although I made a bad decision, I don't want to have to face it because I don't want to admit the fact that maybe I failed at one point in time in trying to do what's right because I really am trying to. Uh, sometimes we get a little defensive is what it really maybe boils down to. Uh, 
Uh, we just can't fathom that we would fail at doing what it is we're striving uh, to do. Uh, we, you know, we know that there's folks out there that they don't care one way or another. They just make bad choice after bad choice, bad decision after bad decision. Uh, do wrong and do wrong and do wrong. And we know that as children of God, we're striving to live a life that is not reflective of that. And so to admit that we've made a bad decision, sometimes maybe in our mind we're thinking, because of pride and because of other reasons, well, I don't want to associate myself with those folks. I'm trying to avoid living a life like that. So I can't fathom and I can't humble myself enough to admit the fact that I made a poor choice. I made a poor decision. Uh, and Brother Lewis here, just in the very beginning, recognizes um, or, or states that rather that uh, regarding bad decisions, um, we, we fail to recognize it. We fail to recognize it. And his second point is we fail to admit it. We fail to admit it. Can you think of uh, situations in the scriptures where folks failed to recognize or failed to admit uh, their sin? There's a whole lot, really. David was one. Sure. David, absolutely. Uh, David uh, took a while, as did others. He had to be confronted. To he, make yeah. Realize it. Right. Yeah, he had to be confronted. He had to be... Uh, uh, approached and finally he came to his senses uh, when he realized the parable of the ewe lamb was in reference to him uh, because it took him essentially um, stating that another was in error till he eventually realized that he just made the proclamation that he himself is in error uh, which is the um, wisdom there of Nathan. Um, let, let's, let's look there for a second. 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. And uh, let, let's read through this. If someone would read for me verses 1 through 6, then if someone else can read <laughs> verses 7 through 12. Let's just start there and then eventually we'll get in uh, to 13 and 14. But let's start off with 1 through 6 and then 7 through 12. <clears throat> Then the Lord sent David to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And the shepherd came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring, one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die, and he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no food. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Can someone else read 7 through 12 for me? And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom. And gave thee the house of Israel and of Judea, and if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the son, of this son. 
for thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. Okay, so uh, very um, clear here to David that his sin is known, which it always is, uh, but Nathan is exposing this. David didn't seem to have any troubles at all recognizing the sin of the rich man uh, in regards to what he did to the poor man uh, because the traveler came. Uh, David was very quick, it seems, based upon the context. It says his anger was greatly kindled against the man. I mean, it seems like, you know, David got worked up pretty quickly and, you know, immediately declared judgment what ought to have been done. So he didn't have a whole lot of difficulty seeing the wrongdoing in another. Uh, and so the Lord is ultimately using his recognition of the wrongdoing by the rich man to then turn it ultimately around on him. Uh, and so let's look at 13 and 14. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Uh, and so the declaration that David declared regarding the rich man that he should die uh, David himself is going to be spared from this judgment at this point. Um, so uh, you, you see here a great instance of one who uh, came around to his senses but wasn't willing to immediately. Uh, why is it that we have such an easy time seeing the sin in others? Do we have an easy time seeing the sin in others? Sure. I do, right? I have an easy time. Uh, I know my brethren do because I've heard this comment before. Well, you should have preached that sermon because so-and-so needed to hear it, uh, which is always baffling to me. But uh, even with siblings or whatever it is, we have a real easy time spotting the sin in other people's lives. Uh, Jesus even speaks of this regarding hypocritical judgment, right? In Matthew chapter 7, uh, concerning uh, judgment that is hypocritical, going out to judge a brother, uh, because of the speck that is in his eye, when yet you have a plank in your own. It's real easy to find sin in, other, in someone else's life, but not in our own. Uh, and so that mindset that we have at times was used here to try to get David uh, to come to uh, his senses and recognize uh, his sin. Um, what are some other examples uh, throughout Scripture of those who did not immediately recognize uh, their sin? Aiken, okay, absolutely. What happened in that situation? That's right. And his whole household uh, ended up being destroyed, um, as well as Aiken, uh, because of the, the sin that he committed. Um, and uh, that sin had dr drastic consequences, because what ultimately was the result of Achan making that decision. They lost the battle. they lost the battle, right? A battle that they clearly should have easily won, given what just took place in Jericho. They come to Ai, uh, and they struggle um, because they ultimately are um, uh, in sin. There's sin in the camp uh, because of Achan. Um, and so Achan eventually uh, admits to Joshua in verse 20 of Joshua chapter 7, um, indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. Uh, why was he ultimately willing uh, to confess this? What had to happen? Uh, let's go there together. Uh, Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7. And someone read for me there verses 10 through 15. Joshua, stand up. Why are you down on your face? The Israelites have sinned, and they have broken the agreement. I commanded them to obey. Obey. They took some of the things I commanded them to destroy. They have stolen and lied, and have taken those things for themselves. That is why the Israelites could not face their enemies. They turn away from the fight and run, because I have commanded that they be destroyed. I will not help you anymore unless you destroy everything as I commanded you. Now go, make God's people holy. Tell them, set yourself apart to the Lord for tomorrow. 
the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Some of you are keeping things he commanded you to destroy. You will never defeat your enemies until you throw away those things. Tomorrow morning you must be present with your tribes. The Lord will choose the tribe to stand along before him. Then the Lord will choose one family group from that tribe to stand before him. Then the Lord will choose one family from the family group to stand before him, person by person. The one who is keeping what should have been destroyed will himself be destroyed by fire. Everything he owns will be destroyed with fire. He has broken the agreement of the Lord and has done a disgraceful thing among the people of Israel. Okay, so you see how God's going to deal with this. Um, Joshua's flabbergasted because they lost. Um, doesn't understand why they lost uh, uh, in, in AI. And uh, he's, you know, basically face planted down on the ground. And the Lord tells him, get up. Verse 10, there's sin in the camp. Uh, so they're going to go about trying to find out uh, who it is that committed this sin. So at this point, wouldn't you think that something needs to be done? I mean... You know, it's, it's like one of those things where, uh, you know, maybe your, your children or maybe, again, you with your siblings or situations maybe we've seen on television where uh, a sin occurs and uh, maybe somebody's hiding something they're not supposed to and the parents say, well, we're going to search every one of your rooms. Well, at that point, you'd think the sibling who has it in their room is going to stand up and say, I'm the one who has it in my room. But that usually doesn't happen, does it? You have to begin searching room by room by room, and eventually you come to the room that it's in, and it's like, you know... You knew we were going to do this. So it's baffling to me that at this point, Achan doesn't just come forward, but he does. Uh, verse 16, so Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the family, verse 17, of Judah, and he took the family uh, of the uh, Zerahites, and he brought the family of the Zerahites man by man, and uh, Zabdi was taken, and he brought his household man by man, and Achan the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, the tribe of the tribe of Judah was taken. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. Well, then Achan answers. And that's verse 20, which you read in a second. So absolutely, Achan is one. Um, there, there are several others we could go to. Uh, one that comes to my mind is Saul. Uh, where Saul committed uh, sin, he refused to destroy. Similar situation there to Achan, in that they were commanded, 1 Samuel chapter 15, uh, to destroy the Amalekites and uh, all that was, was there, and Saul did not. And Samuel comes to Saul, uh, and um, Saul attempts to uh, get his way out of this right away by praising uh Samuel, right away, uh, verse 13 of 1 Samuel chapter 15, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Not only does he not recognize it, not only does he not admit it, what is he trying to do? He's lying, and he's overcorrecting. I mean, he's over the top, right, with his, his, his abundant praise of Samuel. And I have done the commandment of the Lord, just first thing out of his mouth, it seems. And Samuel says, What meaneth then the ble this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Uh, anyway, so they go back and forth uh, several uh, times. <coughs> and uh, Saul finally, in verse 24, says to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Uh, ultimately, it took Samuel having to tell Saul at the end there of verse 23 that Saul was no longer going to be king. Then Saul was willing to admit it. Uh, the difficulty of recognizing our sin and admitting our sin um, is not new. It's not new at all. Uh, one thing exists in regards to recognizing it. There's another thing that exists in regards to admitting it. Can you think of a case where recognizing it occurred, but admitting it did not? Is there anything that immediately comes to mind? Ananias and Sapphira knew what they'd done. Sure, that's a great one. Uh, especially given the fact that you would think, again, similar situation there to Aiken, uh, you would think that uh, uh, Sapphira would have figured out that she needed to, to be pretty clear about it right away. 
um, because Ananias fell, and look at with me in Acts chapter 5. Uh, he falls down, he gives up the ghost, verse 5. Um, they carry him out and bury him about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. Peter answered unto her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, how is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. I mean, she didn't know exactly what had taken place regarding Ananias, but uh, again, an unwillingness uh, to admit their sin. Uh, they recognize it because they just did it. You would think they clearly recognized it. Uh, what's, a, what's another case? Let's go to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. Here, um, it's clear by the reaction of those that Stephen is preaching to that they recognize their sin. But they are refusing to admit it. Uh, let's look, and we're going to start here um, in verse 36. Uh, this is Stephen here preaching to um, the Jews, to the Jewish people. Look with me in verse 36, beginning. He's talking about Moses. It's very interesting, by the way, what Stephen does here. Uh, he goes through several highlights throughout the Old Testament scriptures leading ultimately to the point of the Messiah, reminding them what it was they were looking for and reminding them of their own history, trying to get them to the point of repentance. Verse 36, talking about Moses again of Acts 7, he brought them out after that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you uh, of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt. We remember that, right? They declared and longed for Egypt. They longed to go back into this place of bondage. They uh, talked about the, the melons and how great it was in Egypt. And so what Stephen is doing here, he's laying out for them the history of God's people. Look at how they refuse to accept the teaching and preaching of God's servants. And look at how ultimately they um, refuse to obey uh, the Lord. Verse 40, saying unto Aaron, make us gods to go before us and as for this Moses which brought us out of the land of Egypt we want not what is become of him and they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol and rejected the works of their own uh, of their own hands rejoiced rather in the works of their own hands then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven as it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of forty years in the wilderness? Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Molech and the star of your god Rephim, Rephim, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. So it's talking about uh, the, the carrying away. It's talking about um, God's people ultimately being punished because of their idolatry which Moses had warned them of back in the Pentateuch. Verse 44, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David. Now, Jesus there is Joshua. Uh, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house, howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in the temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all things? Let me ask you a question. Would they have taken offense to this? What did they hold in high, high, high regard? Although hypocritically and 
didn't even really sanctify it like they claimed how great it was. The temple. The temple itself became what? An idol, absolutely. 100%, yes. Uh, they literally thought the temple itself was God. But yet again, hypocritically, because what did they allow in the temple? Money changers who charged a whole lot of interest, and Jesus had to take care of that with a whip, right? Uh, so he's making it very plain unto them, uh, look, um, God doesn't dwell in houses made with hands, temples made with hands. Uh, God has made all things. Verse 51 Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? Again, look back in your history. You all, as a people, have always done this. Uh, verse 50, uh, uh, where are we? Verse 52, the middle there. And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law of the disposition of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said... Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. Did they recognize their sin? Seems to me, I mean, the Bible doesn't say they recognize their sin, but the fact that they're stopping their ears, what are they essentially saying? I don't want to hear this. You're making it too plain, too clear. You, you, you're, you're giving me no out here. And I don't want to admit that I'm in sin. And so because of that, I'm going to have to kill you, right? Quote, kill the messenger. Uh, do we stop our ears today? Do we kill the messenger today? <clears throat> How are some ways that we do this, both in the church and outside? Recognize it, but refuse to admit it. How do we do that? We don't want to hear the truth. We want to hear what we want to hear. Sure, so the tickling of the ears, right, that we're warned about in 2 Timothy 4. Absolutely. So uh, we want sermons to be about cotton candy, about current events, and about something that's going to make us smile and laugh and tell a joke or two and then let us leave. Those are the sermons we want to hear. Folks, that exists. That happens. Uh, too many preachers, too many times, uh, have been told, you preach too much scripture. Folks, I'll never understand that. They may be trying to say something else, but if they are, that's not the words you use. Uh, what are some other ways? Well, another example, we go all the way back to the garden, Adam and Eve. Yeah. And that was also the first guy to blame his spouse. Right, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So we're somewhat. Uh, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And and here comes God. And what do they do? They went hot. They went and hid. So they recognized their sin, but they didn't want to admit it. And and Adam, as soon as God asked him, uh, "Who told you you were naked?" Right. He blames the woman. He blames God. Uh, he's very um, aware of what they've done. It's not that he's oblivious to it. That's the part of the reason they went and hid. Uh, yeah, the husband and wife relationship hasn't changed all the way from the garden, right? We still have our challenges. Right. Uh, what are some other What are some other ways that we're similar to Adam and Eve? That we're similar here to the to the the, the people uh, being preached to by Stephen? We in the church and outside, both. What are some What are some situations that occur? Sure, sure, sure. So they might use other words to justify why, but ultimately what it boils down to is the preacher said something that caused them to recognize their sin. They got their, yeah, it's a great way to say it, right? That's how we say it. 
my toes were stepped on, and, but I don't like that, so I am leaving, and I don't want to hear it any longer. That's a great example. Right. What are some other things? What about, I mean, there's a lot of things we can talk about, right? What about uh, causing division in the eldership? Folks don't like what's going on. They don't like what's being taught. They don't like how things are being dealt with. They don't like church discipline. They don't like the fact that folks that don't attend faithfully to the services are being checked up on and uh, being warned uh, that they don't want to be withdrawn from. They don't like the fact that sin's being preached on. They don't like the fact modesty is being preached on. Uh, you know, it seems like every time we're able to maybe get rid of the preacher, a uh, new preacher comes in preaches on the same thing. So now we got to cause issues in the eldership. That's how folks will respond. They recognize it. They realize it. Uh, but they don't admit it. Uh, what are some other examples? That's just a bunch of hypocrites down You're right. That's exactly <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so instead of recognizing our sin and, and admitting it, we recognize it, uh, but we more so want to recognize it in others. And theirs is so bad. Uh, and I'm certainly not going to admit my sin, but I can tell they're not willing to admit theirs, so I'm not going to have anything to do with that. Absolutely. I think we hear that more than anything sure. I have over the years. Sure. They're just hypocrites. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. That's what I was going to well, say. And, and you know, it's interesting because it's real easy to be a hypocrite when you don't stand for anything. Mm -hmm. It's real easy to avoid ever being called a hypocrite when literally you don't stand for anything. Right? Uh, we have family members that are that way. Literally, don't stand for anything. Anything goes. Doesn't matter. There's no, no rules, no bounds. All's open. So it's easy to call everybody else a hypocrite. They don't have any standards. Right? Uh, we've had a lady, I think I've mentioned this before, but uh, cut out of her Bible, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Cut it out of her Bible. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Cut it out of the Bible. Well, recognize it. It's not even the only verse that says it, though. Uh, yeah, that's right. They got a lot more verses to cut out, right? Well, they, got, they got an issue. They got holes all over there. Right. Um, it's called the Holy Bible. Absolutely. That's a good one. <laughs> Filled with holes. Yeah. And then I, I've had people tell me, especially in the Catholic Church, like you're not supposed to read those chapters or right. those, you know, right. things. Right. Okay. I was, you know, trying to convert a Catholic. She said, "Oh, we're not supposed to read those." Well, I'll have to. Right. <laughs> right. We're forbidden to read those. Right. Um, so there's lots of things that can keep us ultimately uh, from admitting. Um, our, our sin. Recognizing it is one thing, admitting it is one thing, uh, but is admitting it alone enough? <clears throat> Let me ask you a question. Do, do we have folks, or have we, or have we heard folks before, be very willing to recognize sin, be very willing to admit sin, but that's about the extent of it? It's okay. I can't don't, really stop, don't stop. Don't stop. Just You're right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Literally. And, and folks, this is very prevalent in the denominational world because Calvinism teaches that we're all sinners, we're all sinners inherently, we're all just filthy, rotten, awful sinners. And so literally the idea is let's go running around bragging about how awful sinners we are. And so literally folks just think it's funny and it's, you know, it's a good old time to just have sin, admit sin, claim that you admit sin. I'm not willing or I'm not in any way ashamed to admit my sin, but I'm never going to do anything to address it. Well, that's an issue too. Uh... And, and that can have um, big-time consequences. Uh, admitting it alone does not take us far enough. Think about other situations where if we just admitted, we were, that's all we did. Think about in the medical field. If all you did was admit that you didn't know how to operate on something. Or if in your job you just simply admitted uh, that you failed to do something the right way, but you didn't ever do anything else about it. You wouldn't make it very long. <laughs> that kind of work. Uh, if I wrote to my teacher and said, I admit that I didn't study, and I recognize that I'm going to get an F on this paper or on this test, 
doesn't get me very far. A uh, teacher might be willing to say, well, good job for recognizing and admitting that, but, I mean, is it, so? You can't just write that on every test. Yeah, go ahead. But in the religious world, okay, so you didn't study and you might have answered God's love and God's going to let you in because God's love. Correct. And that's the mindset. Correct. Right, and that, that kind of goes back again a little bit more to this Calvinistic approach, which it's all connected right there, really, um, which is essentially... Uh, can't fall from grace and once saved always saved and um, you know God's going to save who he wants to save and it doesn't matter how many issues I have in my life but my God's a loving God my, my God's, my a, God's loving God. not a mean God right. your God must be a really hateful God correct that's not my Jesus literally that's is what people will God. say that, that's what people will say and, and, and all the while, they fail to read and really reflect upon the words that God has given us, uh, which ultimately teaches us that uh, he wants us to be corrected. He wants us to be chastened. That what we hear that causes us to recognize and lead to admitting sin is done so that we can make a change. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, um, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons, for what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Uh, goes on to verse 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Uh, now, why and how are we going to end up being partakers of his holiness? If we do what? Are in subjection unto the Father. Meaning, doing what he says. Uh, making changes to the things that we have recognized and admitted we are in the wrong. Uh, so let's uh, finish this up next week, Lord willing. Um, we'll go through, uh, learn from it, and forget it in more detail. And also probably just have an overall review of the book uh, just to get a, a context of what it is that Brother Lewis taught us uh, and some takeaways. Uh, happy to hear your input regarding the next set of classes, so please let me know and uh, enjoy the class very much. Thank you.